Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook. Facebook.com slash Radio Detectives. Today's program is brought to you in part by the financial support of our listeners. You can support the show on a one-time basis, support.greatdetectives.net. You can also become one of our ongoing Patreon supporters and send along a donation once a month for as little as $5 a month. Just go to patreon.greatdetectives.net. Also, over at greatdetectives.net this weekend, check out my reviews of uh, Agatha Christie's uh, Lost Radio Plays. Uh, Three different radio plays from the 1950s and 60s that haven't been played for a good while. We'll take a look at them and see if they're any good. You can get the reviews automatically sent to your Kindle. You can try that service out. Uh, for two weeks for free, just search for Great Detectives of Old Time Radio in the Kindle Store. All right, it's time for today's episode of Dragnet. The original air date, May the 24th, 1953, and this one is The Big Gun. <laughs> Detective Sergeant, you're assigned to auto theft detail. You get a call from a truck rental service. One of their trucks has disappeared. There's no sign of the man who rented it. Your job, find him. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Monday, April 20th. It was warm in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of auto theft detail. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Nelson. My name's Friday. I was on my way into the office, and it was 8.02 a.m. when I got to room 40. Auto theft. Hi, Frank. Hi. Where'd you get the sunburn? Went fishing yesterday. Yeah? Where'd you go? Down Newport. How'd you do? Didn't. What do you mean? I didn't. Yesterday's the first day off we've been able to collect for a month. Yeah, I know. Last Thursday, I checked with a skipper. Said it looked like I'd be able to make it sure this weekend. Mm -hmm. So I called a place. I made reservations. All set. Going to go fishing. Yeah. Saturday night, I got all my tackle out. Took my reel apart. Cleaned it. All ready. Stay packed to lunch. Real good. Mm -hmm. I'm all set. Get up at 4.45 in the morning. I drove down to Newport. Beautiful morning. Yeah. Sun mm -hmm. shining. Little wind, you know. Really looking forward to it. Going to be a real day off, you know. Mm -hmm. Get down there. Get on the boat. Not many people, maybe 15 or 20. Yeah, not many for a Sunday, was it? No, that's why I think I got it made. I got a place right at the back of the boat, and we shoved off. I went down to get some breakfast. You know, load up and really pull those fish in. Yeah. Yeah, I got to Wheaton, went up on deck. Where do you suppose we were? Well, I wouldn't know. I'll take a guess. Frank, I wouldn't have the least idea. All right, where were you? Right back at the dock. What? Yeah, right back at the dock. They'd gone out to the ocean, and the water was so rough, they turned around and came right back. And all the while, I'm down below having breakfast. I didn't even see the ocean. Oh, well, that's too bad, isn't it? Yeah. Picked up my tackle when I were and fished on the pier. Out there all day. Ate my lunch and fished all day. Well, how'd you do there? Pretty good, huh? All day, just getting a blister on my lips from the sun. I just sat there. Yeah, well, did you catch anything? How'd you do? Skunk. Huh? Skunk, Nothing. You mean you didn't catch anything at all? Oh, a couple of little perch. Uh-huh. Skunk. Yeah, well, it's too bad. Did you check the book? My day off. I'm skunk. I get it. Auto theft, Friday. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, when did it go out? Yeah, just a minute. All right, what's that address again? Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay. 
We'll be right there. You bet. Bye. I'll get your hat. Yeah? Truck rental company out on Pico. Guy came in Saturday and rented a two-ton from him. Yeah. Said he'd be back in a couple hours. Uh Uh-huh. They haven't seen him since. Eight twenty-four a.m. We drove out to the address of the Coventry U Drive Truck Service. The lot was on the corner of Pico Boulevard and Cambridge Street. Along the front of the place were several panel and pickup trucks, and in the back of the yard was one large stake truck. The office was in a small wooden building at the rear of the lot. We went in and talked to the manager, Mr. Stephen Cole. I tried to check him this morning when the truck wasn't back. Once the landlady said she saw him come home with the truck set, she hasn't seen him since. What's the man's name, Cole? The name he used when he rented the truck was uh, George Summers. Did he have any identification? Yeah, he had a driver's license. I got the number here on the slip. Oh, here it is. It's a California license. You've got to have one to rent a truck. Uh-huh. He signed his name uh, George R. Summers. Number of the license was uh, W414626. 26, huh? Mm-hmm. What kind of a truck was it? A new Ford. Just got a couple weeks ago. Brand new. What color was it? Blue, light blue. Had the name Coventry painted on the side. Name's in the cream color. What kind of a truck is it? Two-ton steak. Well, is it possible that this Summers is just keeping it out longer than he said he would? Possible, but it isn't likely. Said when he came in, he wanted to haul a load of furniture. Said he just needed a couple of hours. That was Saturday morning. We haven't heard a word from him since. I got Red out looking for it now. Who's Red? Works for me. Oh, I see. Uh, when a truck is late getting back, we usually call first and send one of our men out to check on it. Uh, Red drove over to see the Summers. He left about an hour ago. I haven't heard from him yet. Oh, I see. Do you get a deposit on the truck? Yeah, we do. Some of the places don't, but we get one. Twenty bucks. Uh, did the Summers pay cash? No, he gave me a check. Haven't had a chance to deposit it yet. I'll call the bank later. Uh-huh. Can you give us a description of the man? Well, not very good. I was out in the yard when he came in. I didn't handle the deal myself. I got a look at him, but not good. Would you know him again at the time? Oh, it'd be hard to say. I couldn't be sure. The girl would, though. She wrote out the papers. I wonder if we could talk to her. Yeah, she'll be in at 9. You can talk to her then. You got his address there? I'll see if I can check the name. Yeah. Uh... Oh, here it is. 2462 New Jersey Street. Okay. Can you give us some kind of a description on him? Well, I told you I didn't get a good look at him. He's a small fellow, blonde, maybe 25 or 26 around in there. That's about the best I can do. Excuse me a minute. Yeah. Coming to you, Drive. Yeah, how big? Oh, sure, we got one, yeah. Wait a minute, I'll check. Now, just a minute. Uh, run you 210 the first hour, $1.25 an hour after that. Mm-hmm. No, there's gas in it when you get it, that's right. Oh, you pay for the gas. Huh? Well, there's a twenty dollar deposit. That's right. Well, you get it back. California driver's license. Right. Cole. C O L E. Okay, bye. All right, if I use the phone there. Oh, sure, help yourself. Thanks. <clears throat> Pretty busy, you're right. Yes, sir. Once in a while, we get kind of slow, but it seems like everybody's moving or something all the time. They're back right, ready to try. Yeah, 2626. Got three other places you know around town. Mm-hmm. Hi there, it's Officer Frank Smith, 2633. Mm-hmm. Could you check the name George R. Summers, please? Well, he's described as WMA 2327. Flight bill. And blonde. No, oh, blonde. Possible address is given as 2462. Wonder if we could see the check he left his deposit cool. Two, four, sure, I got a clip on the back of the slip. Yeah. Sure, I'll hang on. Here it is. Uh-huh. That truck is worth about $2,800 as a fan. Oh. Well, you carry insurance on it, don't you? Oh, sure, it's covered, but that isn't the point. That guy that just called wants to rent a two-ton steak. Only got two okay, of them. Somebody else yeah, calls, I'm going to lose the rental. That's what Greg okay, says. Thanks. Probably turn out that deposit check isn't any good either. I'm out all the way around. Mm-hmm. How about it, Frank? Well, I can't be sure. We've got a record on the George R. Summers. It might be it. Address is different, but out of six cards, it's the closest. Done time for possession. What do you mean, possession? It's narcotics. Oh. Well, how about it? Do you want it now? No, nothing on him. You give us the license number of the truck? Yeah, it's right here. I got the body motor serial number two. Lousy phone. Hey, here's a slip. You can copy the dope yourself. Thank you. Tell me you drive. Yeah. Is he there? Uh-huh. You tell me to get right down here. Yeah, you bring them. Right. Well, that's it. Huh? Call us from Reddy. Found Summers in his boarding house. Says he's been there since Saturday night. How about the truck? According to what he told Reddy, he left it out in front of the house Saturday afternoon. Yeah. Came back, it was gone. 9 
9.14 a.m., the owner of the truck rental service called the bank that the deposit check had been written on. He talked to the cashier and found that there was enough money in Summers' account to cover the check. We got a full description from Cole's secretary of the suspect. The check of the truck company records showed that he'd never rented a truck from them before. 9.46 a.m., Summers arrived at the office of the U-Drive company. We talked with him briefly and asked him to accompany us downtown. We got out a local and an APB on the stolen truck. We checked his fingerprints against the record card and got a positive identification. 10.37 a.m., we took him to the interrogation room. You ever been arrested? You know the answer to that. I'd like to have you tell us. Yeah, I saw once, did my time. I'm clean, no parole. Want to tell us about this truck deal? Sure, I got nothing to lose. I didn't have anything to do with it. All right, from the beginning. I rented about noon on Saturday. What were you going to use it for? I had to help a friend of mine move some furniture. Now, what's the friend's name? Louise Jordan. Where she live? 2487 Clifford Street. She got a phone? No. Hey, listen, I don't want you guys going around there and giving her a bad time. According to the landlady at your place, she saw you drive away from the rooming house in that truck Saturday afternoon. How about it? Yeah, how about it? What do you got to say? She's off a rocker. If she saw anybody, 6 2 and even, it wasn't me. Well, the way we get it, she was pretty sure. Well, you get it wrong. According to the record, you were picked up for violation of the state narcotics act, is that right? I don't write the record. If that's what it says, that's what I fell for. Well, let me see your arm. Why? I want to see your arm. Roll up your sleeve. Come on. Look, I don't like the way you guys are acting. You got nothing on me. Now, if you got anything to say, say it and get it over with. You got nothing? Let me get out Sit of down. here. Sit down. Sit down, Tommy. Come on. I know. Roll up your sleeve. Let me see your arm. Not going to prove anything. Roll it up. Yeah. Looks like you've been riding kind of high. It's not as bad as it looks. A lot of scar tissue. That's yeah. from before. They look fresh. When's the last time you had a pop? A long, long time ago. How long? I don't remember. You holding now? No. You got a habit? No. Nothing rough. A joy pop once in a while. You must think you're playing with kids, Summers. Why don't you stop conning us? You look like you're hooked and you know it. You're as bad as my landlady. Frank? Yeah. You want to get in touch with narcotics? See if Roxy can come over. Sure, right away. What's the deal on calling him over? Why do you have him look at your arm, see what he thinks? He'll tell you it's like I said. Well, there's one sure way to find out. What's that? Drop you in a cell and wait. If you haven't got a habit, you won't mind. We're going to hold you anyway. For what? Story about the truck's got too many holes in it. Well, what do you mean? It's true the way I told you. That's the way it happened. You don't believe anything, do you? Yeah, the truth when we hear it. I'm giving you that. You aren't buying it. Maybe it's the way you're trying to sell it. You want to tell us what really happened to that truck? I told you. I parked it out in front of my house. When I came back, it was gone. Isn't there anything more? Well, if you were home, how come your landlady says she didn't see you from Saturday afternoon on? I came in the back way. For once, the old bat was looking the other way. You mean you stayed in your room all that time? Yeah, that's what I said. What do you do for a living? You mean, do I work? That's right. No. You don't work, huh? No, I had a job, but I lost when? it. When? Friday. What'd you do? A pro diver. Where'd you wash dishes? Place down on 6th. Why'd you get fired? Boss and I had a beef. What about? And he got hacked because I came in late. Roxy's on his way over, John. It's Roxy? Is that uh, Roxy Lucarelli? Yeah, do you know him? Yeah, I ran into him before. Nice guy. Treated me right. He's the one that nailed you? He's one of them. I know these joy pops you've had. Where do you get this stuff? Around. Where around? Here and there. Why don't you come off at Summers? You might think you're playing it cozy, but you're laying a big bomb here. The story you're trying to peddle us is phony all the way through. We know it, and so do you. Now, why don't you level on it? Make it a lot easier. I'd like to, cop. Really, I would. There's just one big problem. Yeah. You're off base. You know it. You haven't got anything on me. I rented a truck. It was stolen. I'm the one that reported it. I didn't try to get away. I'm telling you all I know. You're leaning all over me because I fell once. You guys just can't stand to see anyone carry a lunch bucket for long. You got to try to make it for something, even if you have to build it yourself. You made a big mistake this time, cop. You haven't got anything on me that you can stick. All I got to do now is keep my mouth shut and you're up an alley. And that's what I'm going to do. You're not going to get another word out of me. All right, now tell us again about the truck. Come on, what time did you find out it was gone? You tell us that. Did you leave the keys in the truck when you parked it? All right, mister, you plan it smart. Let's see how long you can make it last. We'll see how it is after you've been sitting in the cell for a few hours. We'll try it again then, huh? I'm going to take my time. You do that. We got a lot of it. Sergeant Roxy Lucarelli came over from the narcotics division to talk to the suspect. Summers would say nothing. The marks on Summers' arm were fresh, and indications were that he was a narcotics user. Summers was booked at the main jail on suspicion of violation of the State Narcotic Act, a felony. Frank and I, along with Sergeant Lucarelli, went over to the suspect's rooming house. A thorough search of the place netted us nothing. We talked with the landlady, and she gave us the same story she'd given the owner of the U-Drive truck service. She said that it was possible for Summers to come in through the back of the house and get to his room without being noticed. But she told us that there'd been several phone calls for him on Sunday, and that when she'd knocked on his door, there'd been no answer. 5.30 p.m., 
We checked back into the office and found that there'd been no replies to the broadcast we'd gotten out on the truck. We ran Louise Jordan, Summer's girlfriend, through R&I, but we found no record on anyone answering her description. We drove out and talked to her, and she verified the suspect's story about moving the furniture. A meeting with the district attorney's office decided that there was not enough evidence to bring Summers to court on the narcotics charge and not enough to issue an indictment for the theft of the truck. He was released from custody. In the next three weeks, we got reports of four more trucks being stolen. The M.O. was the same as with the Coventry U. Drive theft. In each instance, the persons involved were checked out, but the leads we came up with let us know where. Additional M.O. bulletins were gotten out, warning all operators of U-Drive agencies to be on the lookout for a thief or thieves unknown. Another two weeks passed. The thefts continued, but the thieves had switched their method of operation. They were now stealing privately owned automobiles from parking lots and in front of homes. Thursday, June 4th, Frank and I checked into the office. I got it. Auto theft, Friday. Yeah, now please, put it through. It's Al Gaten from San Diego. Yeah? Yeah, hi, Al. Uh-huh. When? Yeah. Will anybody near it? How about papers? Yeah, no, we'll be right down. Yeah, okay. What? Uh-huh. You've been keeping up. Right. Well, maybe it is. No, we'll leave here right away. We'll see in about, uh, well, let's see, it's 10.20 now. About three hours? About how long will it take it for yeah, right. Right, bye, Al. Well, he says that truck from Coventry U Drive has been found. Where? Just outside Rosarito Beach in Mexico. Yeah. Found new registration papers and something else under the seat. Huh? Twelve bindles of heroin. You are listening to Dragnet, the authentic story of your police force in action. with Captain Nelson about the latest developments in the case, and he instructed us to leave for San Diego. When we arrived at San Diego, we checked with their auto theft detail and with Sergeant Al Gayton. He went with us to the border. We talked with the authorities at the border, but they could give us little information. They said that they'd received the bulletins we'd sent out, but that they hadn't seen the stolen vehicle. We checked with the authorities at Tijuana, and with them, we drove to the location where the truck had been found. A thorough search of the area was started, but we turned up nothing. None of the people in the immediate vicinity could tell us anything about the truck. From the registration slip, we got the name of the owner. The license plates were issued by the state of California, but a check showed that they'd been taken from a wrecked car. The narcotics found in the cab of the truck were turned over to the Mexican police. The next morning, Frank and I left for Los Angeles. While we'd been gone, officers Bill Donovan and Jack Pilkington, along with Sergeant Al Mansell, had been following up the leads in the Los Angeles area. They hadn't come up with anything new. The car thefts continued. State police units along the road to the Mexican border were alerted, but the cars continued to disappear. Two weeks went by. Tuesday, June 23rd, Frank and I came back from a meeting with members of the National Auto Theft Bureau. Want to check the book? Yeah, I'll get it. One of these thefts are sure dropping our recovery record, aren't they? Yeah. Talked to Skipper this morning. The insurance companies are raising the roof. I figures it's costing them a lot. There's a message here from Judge Shelton. Wants us to call him. Sheriff's Department? Yeah. Mark the Porton. And you want to get it? Yeah, I'll get it. Narcotics, please. Yeah, uh, Judge Shelton, man? Yeah, thanks. He's there, sir. The judge is Frank Smith over at all of us? Yeah. Oh? Well, why do you think that's it? Yeah. When are you going to meet her? Mm-hmm. Okay, we'll be right over. Right. Goodbye. Anything? Yeah. Judge got a call this morning from a girl because she's been invited down to Mexico. Yeah. Says two of them are going down to pick up some heroin. Yeah. Where do we fit in? Girl told Judge they'd be driving a stolen car. Justice and talked with Sergeant Judge Shelton. 
He told us about the call he'd received. He said that he was supposed to meet the girl at 3.30 that afternoon, and he wanted to know if we wanted to accompany him. We told him we did, and at 3.15 p.m., the three of us walked into a bar on West 7th. We waited for the girl to arrive. 3.46. Here she comes. A bar? Yeah. Hi, Ken. Sir, I'd like you to meet a couple of friends of mine. Sir Collins, Frank Smith, Joe Friday. How are you, Thank sir? Thank you. Sit down, Barry. Thanks. Can I get you anything? Sandwich, cup of coffee? No. I could use an old-fashioned, though. Tell him to give you a big piece of orange. Okay, I'll get it. Excuse me. Sure. You two guys cops? Yes, ma'am. Where do you work out of? Central Auto Theft. Well, that's why Jed called you, huh? Pardon? About the hot car we're driving south. Yes, ma'am. My name is Vera. Why don't you use that? All right, Vera. You know where the stolen car is, the one they're going to drive down? Not now. I will, though. What do you mean? I don't think it's been stolen yet. What? Well, I don't think the car's been stolen yet. Well, do you know when it's going to be taken? Sometime this afternoon. We're supposed to leave tonight. You know who's going to take it? This friend of mine. A fellow named Harry Sloan. Mm -hmm. Here's your old fashioned girl. Oh, thanks, Jed. You know how this operation's going to work, Vera? No. All I know is I got a call from Harry this morning. He asked me what I was doing. I told him nothing, so he asked me if I wanted to take a drive down to Mexico. I told him I would, and he said he'd pick me up. He's going to pick you up at your house? No. No, he said he'd call me and let me know where to meet him. Well, where is he going to call you? My place in about an hour. What did he say it makes you think the car's going to be stolen? Just the way he talks. Can't say anything real definite. You know, just the way he talked. Do you work alone? No, there's another guy with him. I don't know who it is. What did he say to you about the narcotics? He said that he was planning to pick up some H down there. Didn't say where. He gave us a description of this alley, where he lives? Yeah, I can give you that. Got a record, do you know? Never talked about it. I think maybe he's been picked up a couple of times, but I don't think he served time. You said on the phone you had an idea how we could take him. Yeah. You see, I'll have to drive my car to meet them. As soon as I get a call from Harry, I'll get in touch with you and tell you where the meet's going to be. I'll park my car and leave the license number of the stolen car in it. Where? In the back seat. Judd, wouldn't it be a lot easier if we just kept her under surveillance? Might be better for you, but it wouldn't for me. Harry found out I'd been playing footsie with you guys. He'd kill me sure. This is a big operation. And just Harry in on it. What do you mean? All those cars that have been stolen lately, uh -huh. the trucks, it's all part of the deal. Same bunch is doing it. Oh, you mean it's an organized ring? Huh? Sure. They got it all laid out from here in Sonata. All the way it's planned. You know who the top man is? No. I never heard the name here. He never used it. Well, they take all the trucks down to Mexico, do they? Hmm? From what I understand, most of them end up down there. You got any idea how they do it? No. What do you want out of this? What? Well, where are you going to come out, Vera? Why are you telling us all this? Judd gave me a break once. This is my way to pay him back. Harry doesn't mean anything to me. I don't care if you get him. Well, I still think we ought to keep you under surveillance. Be safer for you, Vera. Don't worry about it. I'll let you know right where I'm going to park my car. You find that, and I'll see that the other information's there. I better get going now. Well, just a minute. You want to give us a description of Sloan? Sure, I can tell you what Harry looks like. What are you going to do, check up on him? We'd like to know who we're after. I don't think you'll find anything. I'd be pretty surprised if you do. Not as surprised as he'll be. We got the description of Harry Sloan and called the office to check the name. There was no record of anyone answering his description. Vera Collins was unable to tell us anything about the second man in the operation. She went back to her home and waited for the phone call from Sloan. We returned to the office and waited for her to contact us with the information about the stolen car. At 5.15 p.m., we got a call from her saying that her car would be parked somewhere within a 16-block area. From Washington Boulevard to the north, Adams Boulevard to the south, from Crenshaw Boulevard to the west, and Arlington Avenue to the east. Frank, Judge Shelton, and I drove out to the area and began to cruise the vicinity. We spent the next hour looking for the car. When we were sure that it was not in the designated area, we began to expand our search. At 6.37 p.m., we found the car parked on a small side street near St. Charles Place, 12 blocks outside the designated area. We searched the car and found a slip of paper in the back seat. It said, Chevrolet sedan, blue color, 1C33272. We'll try to stall Harry on way to Tijuana. It was signed Vera. We got out a local and an APB with special attention to the border patrol on the car, asking that if it was found abandoned, 
to place a stakeout on it and to notify us immediately. It was 7.02 p.m. when we started to drive to the Mexican border. We kept in constant radio contact with Sergeant Al Gayton at the border, and he told us that the suspect's car had not crossed over yet. 10.37 p.m. We drove through National City and took the road to Tijuana. Just south of Chula Vista, we picked up a car that matched the description of the stolen vehicle. How about it, Joe? Yeah, it matches. Frank, can you get a little closer? Yeah, I think so. Different license plate, Judge. Probably switched to cold plate. That's why they haven't been spotted before. You see him yet? Yeah, it's the column blowing all right. Want to take him now? Yeah. I'll get the fan. Doesn't look like they're going to stop. I'll make a try for the tires, Frank. Wait a minute, Joe. Yeah, road's clear ahead. All right. They're slowing down. Yeah, they're pulling over. All right, get your hands on that wheel where I can see them. I'll cover the other side. Right. Come on. All right. All right, get out of the car. What are you trying to prove with all this shooting? Come on, mister, get out of the car. Come on, you two, get out. I don't know what you're trying to prove. We haven't done anything. Come on, come on, let's don't argue. All right, mister, over to the car. I'll take him, Joe. I'm going to be sorry about this. You've got a right to stop us. Stand still. Yeah, he's clean. Turn around. You're George Summers, aren't you? Yeah. They picked you up for that stolen truck about six weeks ago, wasn't it? Yeah, you had to let me go. You're going to do the same this time. you got nothing to hold me on. No, you're wrong there, Summers. Where'd you get this car? I borrowed it. From who? A friend of mine. He knows you took it, huh? Certainly. He told me to. This car's stolen, and you know it. We know all about the operation, the whole deal. You're going to stand the rap alone, or you're going to tell us who the big gun is? What do you mean, operation? This isn't the first car you've shoved across the border. We know about the narcotics, too. You're in this all the way. Now, you've got a choice. You can take it alone, or you can go along with us and nail the big guy. It's up to you. Wouldn't do any good if I told you who he was. I can't prove anything on him, neither can you. You'll never get him, never. Is that right? Sure, he told me so. Cops will never get me. Those are his words. That's what he said. Well, that's not new. Huh? You said the same thing. The story you have just heard is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. On November 19th, trial was held in Department 89, Superior Court of the State of California, in and for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. George Richard Summers and Harry Alden Sloan were tried and convicted of grand theft auto, one count. They received sentence as prescribed by law. Grand theft auto is punishable by imprisonment in the state penitentiary for not less than one, nor more than ten years. Next week, The Big Gun, Part Two. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police, W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Technical advisors, Captain Jack Donahoe, Sergeant Marty Wynn, Sergeant Vance Frazier. Heard tonight were Ben Alexander, Jack Crucian, Herb Ellis. Script by John Robinson. Music by Walter Schumann. Hal Gibney speaking. For a million laughs, tune in Chesterfield's Martin and Lewis show, Tuesday on this same NBC station. Tonight, it's Adventure with Barry Craig on NBC. Welcome back. Well, I like a strong uh, ending. This one definitely does have that. I am glad that it did turn out the first guy that they questioned really uh, did have some involvement in the scheme. Uh, Because otherwise, it would have just been their suspicions had goaded someone into not cooperating. Well, now we turn to listener comments and feedback, and Bill says, Hey, Adam, regarding the question after this episode about whether Dick Powell performed the whistling during his opening theme of Richard Diamond, according to Wikipedia page for Richard Diamond, private detective, Powell did indeed uh, perform the whistling. And Andrew uh, actually uh, re- responding to the original question from Amy found that Radio Classic said the same thing. So there you go. I think it's pretty clear that 
uh, Dick Powell was not above doing his own whistling. Uh, he whistled for his work. And Joey says, how many times has the landlady, pretending not to be a busybody, and yet is a busybody and is able to tell the detectives a whole lot about the person he's asking about, been used in these old-time detective shows? I say countless times, but it's still fun to listen to them. And that is, uh, that is, that's definitely true. I think there are a couple things to it. One is that the there is this real true to life nature of it, uh, because no one really wants to own and says, "Yeah, I'm a pretty shameless gossip." When you come down right to it, and I've got my nose in everybody's business, no one wants to admit that. Uh, and so there is this real fact that the way that they're acting is totally consistent with human nature, and human experience. Uh, so it works in that sense, even though it's done a lot. And I think there's also just some, you know, nice humor in it. And it, I think one of the big challenges and kind of misconceptions when it comes to creativity is that the challenge is always to do something uh, different and uh, to do something completely new. Uh, but uh, sometimes it's just to do something that the audience really likes seeing and to do it in a way that's entertaining. So thanks so much for the comment, Joey. And that will do it for today. Join us back here tomorrow for Video Theater. It'll be an episode of Dragnet. Then on Monday, we begin our run through detective shows all over again with an episode of Mr. Keen, Tracer of Lost Persons. And next Saturday, we'll uh, wrap things up with another episode of Dragnet. In the meantime, send your comments to Box13 at Great detectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash Radio Detectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.